just after 9 p.m. Uh, here in Canberra, uh, which I'm joining you from. Uh, so good morning to you uh, and good evening or good afternoon to if you're joining us uh, from other time zones. Um, so what I'm going to do is share uh, my screen with you. I hope that works and share some slides with you. I'll try and talk for more like 25, 30 minutes, Anisha, so that we've got plenty of time for discussion. Leah can always sort of yell at me politely or impolitely as, as Zoom permits. Um, let me try and share my screen and get going. Um, so I'm going to start with the first sentence of my book, uh, which Shanisha kindly introduced to you, which is this. Uh, there are two main ways of approaching the study of revolution in the contemporary world, and they're both wrong. And I wanted to start by explaining why I think they're wrong as a way of trying to um, uh, talk about some of the foundations of, of my book and then introduce its main themes. So on the one hand, the, the first position that I think is mistaken is this idea that revolution is everywhere. Uh, that we find it recently in the streets of, of Minsk or even Bishkek, of Hong Kong, of Kobani, uh, more recently last year in uh, Algeria uh, and Sudan. Uh, in some ongoing struggles that we don't always pay much attention to, but possibly sh should. So my example here is the Naxalites of Central and Eastern India now, uh, since the peace process in Colombia, the world's longest ongoing armed revolutionary movement. We see it then uh, in a slippage between revolution and social movements, which I want to talk about a bit uh, amongst uh, activists within Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion. I think I'm right that the first iteration of Extinction Rebellion actually called itself a revolutionary movement and then at some point downgraded itself to a rebellion. But nevertheless, uh, I think we can see uh, uh, certainly the rhetoric of revolutions in some contemporary social movements and civil disobedience movements. We also find it in election campaigns, most obviously uh, in the United States uh, uh, this time around. And we found it uh, in Britain during the Brexit campaign uh, a couple of years ago. Um, no uh, uh, reason here why the Naxalites are pointing their guns at the Brexiteers, simply an accident, I can assure you. So on the one hand, there's all of these various popular movements that claim a rhetoric of revolution. We find people in the streets, we find social movements, we find any kind of unruly practice, or at least a lot of unruly practices, and in the case of Bernie Sanders, actually uh, uh, within a relatively regularized political process, the rhetoric of revolution doing some work. We also find this uh, in uh, uh, popular culture. There's been a real resurgence of revolution in popular culture over the last few years. We can see it in uh, the Star Wars uh, series. We can see it in uh, the popularity of musicals like Hamilton. And an example that I like to uh, do uh, around the world was when, when I travel, that, was, that was, it was wonderful once upon a time. Hopefully it will be again. I have a look at the domain name for revolution in various uh, places. Uh, so revolution.com, the US domain name, it may not surprise people to learn is a venture capitalist firm. Uh, Revolution.co.uk, the British domain name is a software company, a gaming company. And the one that to me is inexplicable, and it remained inexplicable even two or three months after arriving in Australia, is that the Australian version of this, the one at the bottom right of the screen there, uh, is, a, is a flea and heartworm treatment for dogs and cats. So it's a pet treatment. Why you'd want a pet treatment to be revolutionary is beyond me, but apparently people do. I'm afraid I'm not in Ireland, so I haven't checked, but perhaps someone could check and then we could uh, find out what the revolutionary name, domain name is in Ireland. Uh, but what you can see, I think, here is again this spread of revolution, the way that revolution has really become everywhere. And one thing I always ask students to do at the beginning of a term when we're studying revolutions is just spend a week looking around and seeing where you find revolution and you find a new remarkable uh, uh, lipstick is revolutionary in the way that it colors your lips or there might be a revolutionary new ashtray that can somehow, I don't know, make it feel like you're not smoking or something. Revolutionary new designs of cars are everywhere. Elon Musk is a revolutionary and so on. So this kind of everyday slippage of revolution, which I think is one problem that we have to confront when we're trying to make sense of revolution in the contemporary world. But I think there's actually an equally major problem from the other side of this, which is effectively the denial of revolution. Um, and these are linked, I think, phenomena. On the one hand, it's everywhere, maybe it's nowhere. But on the other hand, there's this idea that the age of revolution has gone. That between, say, 1789 or 1776 and 
1989 with the end of uh, uh, the, the socialist communist experiment in East Central Europe, the idea of capital R revolution, social revolution, a dramatic systemic challenge to economic orders, to forms of governance, to symbolic orders, the idea of a whole revolutionary subject or a revolutionary society has itself run out of steam. That what we have in the contemporary world, if we have revolutions at all, are kind of small R, emaciated revolutions, revolutions that have given up on that notion of profound challenge and systemic transformation. Uh, so a lot of commentators, often conservative commentators, but not only conservative comments, have kind of consigned revolution to the dustbin of history, often with a good riddance uh, as it goes. So these are the two positions that I want to uh, push uh, against and that I want to establish as a foundations uh, for a different way of thinking about revolutions. I think the problem with this first idea of revolution, the revolution is everywhere position, is that it's just too loose. You know, if revolution is everywhere, then what's the difference between a revolution, a rebellion, a social movement, a civil war, a revolt? I think the place of revolution as a form of unruly politics and as a relatively autonomous special form of unruly politics runs the risk of being lost when we dissolve it effectively into any type of form of contention, often with lots of people uh, occupying a public place, demanding that the president uh, go. The problem with the second view, the idea that revolution uh, can be consigned uh, to the dustbin of history, that it's effectively nowhere, is I think it complacency. Revolution is with us as an expression of profound injustice, uh, a, a concern with exploitation, debasement, inequality, the various ways that people mobilize against a particular state transgressively, so not through regular means, but outside the law, outside a constitutional structure, and forcefully attempt to override a regime and replace it with another. That impulse, I think, hasn't gone anywhere. It has changed in form across time and place, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but what I think we need to do is maybe get away on the one hand from thinking about revolution as only capital R social revolution, that only France, Russia, China, and a handful of other cases somehow qualify, start opening up the field of revolution to a wider sense of revolutionary expression, but stop short of then dissolving it into any form of unruly politics. So I'm classically trying to occupy this in-between space. It's a bit fuzzy, I know, and it lacks the precision of saying that revolution is just these big uh, social revolutionary eruptions on the one hand, or it can be any form of transgressive politics on the other, but I do want to make a claim for this relatively autonomous space for revolution, and I'll fill that out uh, in the rest of my remarks. So the starting point then for how we might go about doing this is to distinguish capital R revolution from small r revolutions. And the first move I think that's important to make is just recognize that revolutions are practices that do change in form across time and place. They change in their meaning. Um, uh, in the, before the mid to late 18th century in Europe, uh, we thought of revolutions as largely circular, almost natural, organic movements as if they were seasonal uh, transformations that took place every now and again in a political order. We then got this new novel idea of revolution as rupture, as a year zero, as a place where uh, the whole category of revolutionary was itself constructed in that second half, particularly the last quarter of the 18th century. So revolutions now were man-made, they were made by people, they usually meant men, but it wasn't only men. Uh, and they were somehow uh, lines in the sand from which there were no going back. They were ruptures, they were earthquakes, they were volcanoes. So rather than this idea of a, of a seasonal circulation, they became something novel, dramatic, transformative, immediate and constructed by people. Uh, they've been legitimated in very different ways. Once upon a time, revolutions were fundamentally bound up with what Hannah Arendt called the social question, the idea of mass poverty and inequality. You think about the Bolsheviks in 1917, their fundamental point of orientation was, was an equality understood as your conditions of material subsistence. They were about your uh, uh, productive capacity and how that was the basis for a reordered society. 
I think in the contemporary world, revolutions are more oriented, not wholly oriented, but more oriented around issues of political rights and representation and uh, uh, an end to corruption and despotism and, and a constitutional egalitarianism. The main actors of revolution has, ch has changed. Once upon a time, uh, certainly for Marxists, there was the notion of the working class as the fundamental agent of revolution. Now we have these huge mass movements, millions and millions of people. In the case of Hong Kong, a quarter of the population has been out on the streets uh, over the last year or two demanding fundamental change. So we've seen this shift meaning, character, form of legitimation, main actors, and so on. And I think the first place to start constructing our theorization of revolutions is recognition of this changing form across time and place. The second thing I think we need to think about is what we've been missing. Um, so Sunisha mentioned these various different, revolu uh, various different revolutions, various different generations in the study of revolutions. And I think what's curious when you look at all the different generations of revolutionary theory is how few cases they built the social science of revolutions on. We really have a handful of cases that run from France and probably uh, Haiti these days through Russia, China, Cuba, Iran, Vietnam, Nicaragua, one or two maybe, and then 1989, the end of communism in East Central Europe kind of scrambles the inheritance and we're not quite clear how to place them in this broader panoply uh, of cases that we think about. But I think there's a few different issues there. One is that those cases often aren't quite what they seem. I've always thought it was very odd to premise the social science of revolutions on France when France was a case where uh, the revolution was first usurped by Napoleon and then effectively overturned by the Bourbons uh, 20 years down the line. Uh, you know, de Tocqueville may have had a particular uh, politics to some extent about his claim uh, in the late 1840s that not much had changed in French society over the last half century, but he also wasn't completely wrong. Uh, the notion that revolution stirred up society rather than transformed it seems an odd basis in which to demand a particular revolutionary transformation from which there's no going back, which is systemic in form and content. So there's a kind of mythologization of the history of revolutions, not just the mythologization that revolutionaries tell about revolutions, but a historical mythologization of revolutionary history and revolutionary experience. Second thing is I think we've spent too much time on self-declared progressive uh, are usually, uh, but not wholly secular movements. So constitutionalism and republicanism uh, initially, and then various forms of leftism and anti-colonialism uh, more recently, and then liberalism and, and democratic or democratizing revolutions over the past generation. And we've occluded and excluded deliberately or otherwise uh, movements that look revolutionary sociologically in that they attempt to forcefully uh, collectively transform an existing social order and to do so relatively quickly in all spheres of social life. Uh, how then do we sociologically exclude militant Salafism in the contemporary world and far right movements more generally, perhaps going back to fascism uh, in the interwar period? And I think the rationale for that is more political normative than scholarly. And I think we can learn something from those movements about revolutions in general. I'd be happy to talk a bit more about that, but I'll just leave that hanging for now. Third problem I think is we don't explore why so many revolutions are failed. That we have all of these revolutionary impulses, we have lots of revolutionary movements, we don't have very many successful cases of revolution. Why? Well, often because of successful counter-revolution. Often the experience of 1848 and springtime of nations was not that those characters were less revolutionary than a lot of their contemporaries, it was that the counter-revolution succeeded. You know, you think about 2011 and the Arab uprisings, I don't think the Syrians were less revolutionary than Tunisians, it's just that Assad, backed with powerful international actors and backed with a coercive apparatus that saw the revolution as existential, fought a, a, a counter-revolution and pushed the revolution back. So we've got a selection bias and we only look at successful cases. We mythologize a lot of those cases. We don't look enough at failures. We don't look enough, look enough at revolutionary movements. And we don't look enough, I think, at revolutionary stuff that, is of it, that, is, that doesn't uh, see itself as progressive uh, in some way or another. So the first step, I think, is to open up the field to a much bigger world of revolutionary stuff. And that's what I try and do in the book. And I'll 
show you now the, the structure of how I pass it out and then explain uh, what I think are the three uh, major contributions that I try to make in it. So this is it. Um, the first chapter is, is a chapter about the normativity of revolutions, about why there's such an emotive appeal uh, of revolution and why there's such emotions and uh, affective resonance of counter-revolutionaries, you know, from Burke to Kissinger uh, to characters in the contemporary world, why has there been so much uh, build up about the dystopia of revolution, why it must be uh, halted in its track, strangled at birth, pushed back, all the kind of emotive language the counter-revolutionaries have used. Then I take three different cuts at theorizing revolutions in chapter two is the one Sunisha was referring to when I try and work within and then push a little bit fourth generation studies, which I, I won't talk much about, but I'm happy to uh, uh, later on. Then I have these historical chapters, these paired comparisons where I start with 17th century England, really taking that whole period from the 1640s to the late 1680s as a single revolutionary expression. And I try and be as diverse as possible in terms of my case selection. I'm trying to look at unlike cases as much as possible, and I'll explain why in a minute. And then I've got a couple of chapters on revolution in the contemporary world. So that's the structure. Let me talk about the three uh, main contributions I'm trying to make, and, and then I'll stop. So the first is uh, what Shanisha uh, talked about in his introduction, the attempt to bring uh, international relations, or at least uh, observation of international stuff, I think is the technical term, into the sociology of revolutions more explicitly. Now, uh, from Theda Scotchpole's landmark study in 1979 on, I think it's fair to say that revolutionary studies has spent a fair amount of time on international stuff. But my argument that it's done so in a fairly limited way. And I've taken this example from John Ferrand's Taken Power, which is a, a big important book. I'm not picking on a, some minor uh, uh, point here, I'm picking on a, a major text. And what I think a Ferrand does is something emblematic of revolutionary scholarship from Scotch Pollock. So if you look at uh, Scott uh, Foran's explanation of revolutions, it runs from, from left to right here. You begin with a state in a, in a condition of dependent development on more powerful states. He has in mind, you know, Wallerstein and dependent, dependency theory here. You then uh, get a buildup of revolutionary pressures, then a personalistic exclusionary regime. Think the Shah in Iran or Somoza or, you know, Tsar Nicholas II or whatever it might be. There has to be some type of oppositional culture operating that can mobilize. Uh, there has to be some kind of economic downturn. It doesn't have to be absolute, but it certainly has to be reasonably uh, hard felt. And then you get this curious idea of world systemic opening, by which he means a shift in regional alliance structures or a war, as it was in Scotchpool, but some kind of international uh, let up uh, of external conditions that allows the revolution to explode. And I think there's two different things going on here. And again, I do think it's emblematic, but I'm happy to talk more generally if people don't agree. The first, I think, is that there's an analytical bifurcation here between international and domestic. The first condition is international. The last condition is international. And the three in between aren't. They're not for foreign. Uh, I think that they clearly, to me, are international in fundamental ways. Exclusionary regimes, personalistic regimes, what Weber called you know, sultanist regimes, patrimonial regimes, have friends. You know, they're in alliances. You know, Assad hasn't beaten back uh, the revolution in Syria on his own. He's relied on Putin and he's relied on uh, Iran uh, to help. So there's always alliance structures. You think about the counter-revolutionary move that was less violent uh, in 2011, that of the Gulf monarchies. Again, there was a binding together of a particular group of personalistic regimes in order to push back a revolution. So I think both counter-revolutionary and revolutionary states are part of broader alliances, and, and often those are about shared regime type, including personalistic exclusionary regimes. Secondly, which I'll talk about in a minute, cultures of opposition are transnational local hybrids, you know, ideas of freedom or ideas of equality or ideas of nationalism uh, are, are all uh, in some way shared, albeit with a local inflection. And I think we need to think about the transnational movement of ideas and other forms of uh, strategic mobilization, sharing of tactics and so on, uh, as well as how they're then uh, locally uh, combined in novel and interesting ways. Finally, it seems obvious to me that economic downturns are themselves international. You may feel them 
in particular state society complexes and particular economic orders in slightly different ways, but the, but the idea uh, uh, of an economic downturn being something domestic is something I find pretty odd. So two things going on. One, analytical bifurcation. I'm against that. Secondly, in Foran's model, when you look carefully, you notice that the international isn't really doing anything. Dependent development is effectively the condition of every state in the global south in the world, and perhaps in a world of deep interdependence, the condition of every state in the world, bar none. I mean, COVID is surely uh, an obvious example of that, uh, but there are many others uh, we could talk about. The world systemic opening at the end is just for foreign a kind of like a, there's the pressure cooker has all gone on domestically, and then you just take the lid off or whatever you do in a pressure cooker if you, you know, want it to explode, which you probably don't. Uh, and that, again, isn't quite enough for me. There's something much more interesting going on about the international in all of these factors, but beyond four ends, five factors too. And I want to just uh, fill in very briefly what I mean. So I call my approach an intersocial approach. I do that because I don't want to presume that the international is just about national or societal about societies or interstate just about states i'm interested in transboundary relations of very many kinds and those boundaries i think can come in many shapes and sizes so when we think about the causes of revolutions i think we don't need to look any further than the importance of say client patron relations if you're trying to explain why the belarusian revolution has not been successful so far i think you would look at two different things one is that the the coercive apparatus has lined up behind Lukashenko. And the second is that Putin has made it clear that he's not willing to let him go. Um, so that the, the notion there of state society relations, but also international relations as being fundamentally important is crucial. And you can reverse that obviously in the, you know, absent Gorbachev and new thinking and the shift in uh, ideas of sovereignty in East Central Europe, uh, from the mid 1980s to 1989, I think absent that, it's very difficult for me to think that the revolutions could have taken place when and how they did so. I'm not saying that they wouldn't ever have happened, but I think one of the ways we can explain the timing is the shifting idea of sovereignty and the idea that there was not going to be another 1968. There was not going to be another Soviet stroke Warsaw Pact intervention against uh, expressions of various kinds, popular mobilizations in the region. Uh, second, we can think about the support that some states offer others uh, for revolutions. We can think again about counter-revolutionary histories that look to suppress or roll back or decompress revolutions of various kinds. I've mentioned some, but there are many others uh, we could think of. We've got this idea that I, I highlighted a minute or two ago of the sharing of ideas and images and tactics. I mean, the obvious, the obvious one is Che. Here he is uh, in Palestine, I think. And here he is, I couldn't resist this one on an Irish stamp from 1917 to commemorate the 50th anniversary uh, of his death or commemorate the 50th anniversary of his death. And if people didn't, don't know this story, um, Che's family on his father's side uh, traces themselves back to Ireland. They were called Lynch. And actually one of his father's comments about Che was, if you want to understand Che, you need to understand that at heart he's an Irish rebel. So there you go, it's a good sort of cultural essentialist line. But beyond the cultural essentialism, I think we can, we can make clear the way that these, uh, these type of images and tactics and strategies, once it would have been the vanguard party and people's war and the revolutionary foco, now it's about unarmed protests and occupations of various kinds. Uh, we can see the spread of these, uh, not just the images, but the ideas and tactics over uh, very many places. The one that kind of tickles me historically is the the reappearance of Guy Fawkes, a Catholic activist from the early 17th century in Britain who tried, was part of a plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament that's reappropriated by contemporary anarchist groups via a graphic novel of the 1980s called V for Vendetta with an anarchist uh, protagonist who wore a Guy Fawkes mask. And you see that mask all over the place in terms of contemporary protest. So we see the spread of these images. We see an attempt to export revolution, sometimes deliberately by force of arms. Think about France, or, uh, uh, and then think about sometimes more indirect spread of revolution, the power of emulation, the power of example. Uh, if it happened there, it can happen here. That notion that a revolution can spread like wildfire around a particular region. That's one I think that's not just the kind of nightmares of counter-revolutionaries, it's also the dreams of revolution. They're probably both wrong, but doesn't make it uh, a less powerful uh, political sentiment. 
So that's what I mean by an intersocial approach, the way that the international permeates throughout the process of revolution from cause to trajectory to outcome. So I would make the claim that there are no domestic revolutions and that we're foolish to try and generate this analytical bifurcation between international and domestic and foolish to think uh, that the international has a kind of residual role, whether as permissive, flat context or as final let up. I think it permeates through uh, each and every revolution, albeit uh, in slightly different ways, which again, I'm happy to talk about. Uh, second idea uh, that I mobilize in the book is this notion of historicizing revolutions. By this, I don't mean history matters. Lots of uh, brilliant historians have written lots of brilliant things about revolutions. Almost everybody, whether you're coding and carrying out large N work uh, or doing case study work of various kinds, pays attention to histories of revolutions. What I mean by this really goes back to that notion of thinking about revolutions changing over time and place. You know, the starting place for this is thinking that effectively all revolutions are singular in that they're fundamentally unrepeatable. Now, revolutionaries often think that they can repeat a revolution, sometimes over huge swathes of time. The French look back on the English, the Bolsheviks look back on the French, or just as a revolutionary wave is unwinding, like in 2011, you see this uh, experience of revolution spreading from border to border. That notion of if it happened there, it can happen here is very powerful. Uh, but there is a singularity, I think, to histories of revolutions, to the actual experience of revolutions. And the question is, what do we do with that? We could simply tell singular historical narratives, or we can search for patterns, patterns in history and causal configurations, which I'm going to explain as a concept in a minute, which try and tell us something beyond that immediate case. So with apologies to Charles Tilly, who I borrowed this idea from, what I'm interested effectively are traffic jams rather than solar eclipses. So what Tilly said was that revolutions like other forms of social phenomenon aren't solar eclipses. They're not about regular celestial motion. They're following a precise schedule under stable conditions. They're much more like traffic jams. Now, you know, traffic jams, we, we can associate with a bunch of different phenomena, you know, bad weather, um, accidents, um, the buildup at particular times of day, um, you know, bad driving, roadworks, but we can't predict the same sequence that traffic jams happen within. So it might be there's a day when you have a sequence of bad weather and traffic lights and there's either no or little traffic jam, you can have a day when the whole thing grinds to a halt. So what you have to do is be attentive to the recurrent patterns that you can associate with revolutions while allowing the particular sequence within, within, they which, uh, within which they emerge to be historically specific. That's the kind of line here I'm trying to draw between historical singularity and robust enduring interactions and patterns. So that's what I call uh, these causal configurations. I find uh, eight of them uh, in the book, uh, which we can talk about, which again go from uh, cause to uh, outcome. I've already mentioned, for example, that the, the essential relationship between client patron relations and uh, the causes of revolutions, the hold of the coercive apparatus in terms of how they play out. And I could mention uh, others in discussion if people are interested. But the bigger thing I wanted to get over here was again, me trying to occupy this fuzzy, hopefully not too fuzzy, in between position between respect for historical contingency and singularity and enduring. Patterns. That's why I chose those unlike cases. If I can find some enduring patterns across these cases, then maybe they can help us uh, find something that works uh, beyond and outside their particular experiences. So it's about these portable insights across time and space. Can we both do justice to particularity and do uh, some explanation or explanatory work uh, that goes beyond that? Final point, uh, relationality and relationalism. Uh, so really, this is, again, premised on that notion, which seems obvious to me, um, but apparently isn't obvious uh, to a lot of uh, revolutionary scholarship before, that revolutions just aren't a single thing. And if you try and give them a set of particular attributes or properties, excuse me, that flatten uh, their historical variation over time and place, then you just, you know, they elude you. They're too complex, too different, too difficult to give you that flat 
attribute laden, property laden view of what they are. Most people think that revolutions have to be violent. Well, then what do we do with unarmed movements uh, in the contemporary world? By the way, unarmed movements that have a longer history than we often give them credit for. You go back to the constitutional uprisings at the beginning of the century, debates about uh, revolutionary violence among leftist circles in the last part of the 19th century and so on. So, it, you know, new wine or bottles to some extent. How major do these major transformations have to be? There's a kind of eye of the beholder dimension to this. When do you count this? Five years, 10 years, 30 years, 100 years after the particular uh, revolution? It's a pretty uh, tricky uh, judgment call. The revolutionaries always need a new idea, a new motivating ideology. This was always one of the criticisms of the revolutions of 1989 in East Central Europe. There's nothing new that's come out of these ideas. But like other revolutions, they were a synthetic smorgasbord of ideas of nationalism, of liberty, of equality, of freedom, even of anti-politics as a kind of mobilizing uh, force, the same way that many anti-colonial revolutions mixed uh, forms of leftism with nationalism, with populism, anti-imperialism, anti-racism, and so on. That to, that to me is a curious way to try and demarcate a revolutionary line in the sand. And you know, when it comes to class, which again is part of many people's definitions, there have been virtually no class-based insurrections in the Marxian understanding of what a class-based revolution should look like. They're always multi-class coalitions of various kinds. So revolutions elude us. They elude this attribute property-laden view. So what I try and do then is work with uh, the changing form of revolution across time and place. And again, my idea here is not to give up on the notion of patterns, not to give up on the notions of shared forms, but not to claim a uniformity of structure. That revolutions, I mean, it's easy to, to go after Scotch Bowl 40 years after the fact, and it is a fantastic book, but that's what Scotch Bowl does. She says, look, these the people don't know the book. It's, she has this comparison of France in the late 18th century, China in the mid uh, 20th century, and uh, uh, the Bolshevik revolution uh, somewhere in between and she has the sort of notion that she's comparing the same thing and there's a notion of world historical time that somehow stays flat from the late 18th century up to the mid 20th century and that's just pretty odd right the second you start thinking about that you think was was world history historical time really the same thing in 1949 as it was uh, in 1789 were these agrarian empires really sufficiently similar to be able to make the type of causal claim she wants to about this particular category of social revolution i'm not sure um, uh, I would prefer not to go with that attribute property laden notion and instead embrace the relationality of form without looking for uniformity of structure. So I'll end with a, a visual representation of what I mean. Uh, we've got on the left the famous Liberty Leading the People, uh, 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 a picture by Eugène Delacroix. It's actually of the 1830 revolution rather than 1789, but you've got the personification of Liberty Marianne there with the flag and musket leading. Uh, the revolutionary uh, uh, characters uh, over the ruins of Paris, strikingly similar to the, to the portrait on, on the right, at least my right, of Gezi in uh, 2013, and of uh, Palestine uh, in November 2018. This is Aid uh, Abu Amro, who says a kind of um, nasty um, sort of sequel uh, to this photo, which is actually targeted by Israeli security forces and shot, not lethally, after this because he thinks the, uh, the picture went uh, viral and was widely shared. But regardless of that reminder of the importance of coercive power and state society relations to revolutionaries of various kinds, what I want to get across here is the way that these pictures are the same, same, but different, as they say in Thailand or the North London saying, and which is where I grew up, is, you know, same dinner, different gravy that there's something here about the shared forms without requiring them to have the same structure across time and place. And that relationality and that acceptance of relationality, I think doesn't mean that we can't find and look for these shared forms. And I'll leave uh, what those shared forms are on a, on a bit of a cliffhanger now and happy to uh, discuss that more as we carry on, but I'll, I'll leave my part of proceedings at least initially for now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. I, I mean, I'm really sorry about this format because usually now we would uh, uh, to have some lunch and, you know, to, to, to continue this conversation. 
an amazing, amazing, amazing lecture. I, I would like to give uh, Sinisha uh, the opportunity to make some kind of a closure because I know also that uh, many of his students uh, were here today with us. And just for you, George, to know that we had a great uh, attendance. So it was- Thank you. Again, just to thank you, George, again, for, for taking the time. And I don't know, it's now middle of the night almost. In <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's much easier we are here. But, uh, and I, I would just recommend uh, 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 colleagues and students to read George's book. It's really good. It's, I think the, 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 this is the best book on revolutions to read at the moment. So that's all I can say. Thanks again, George, for joining us. And we thanks to the and thanks to Lair and thanks to everyone. <laughs> it was a fun discussion. It was great. Thank you.